Madam President. The Senator from Delaware. Madam President, good morning. The Senate is uh, now considering S914, the Drinking Water and Wastewater Infrastructure Act of 2021. This legislation was reported unanimously last month by the Committee on the Environment and Public Works on a vote of 20 to 0. I rise today to join Senator Capito and on, or to urge our colleagues to join us in voting for the adoption of this legislation. The legislation will help upgrade our nation's drinking water and water infrastructure, wastewater infrastructure, investments that are sorely needed. Madam President, so that our colleagues understand the real need for drinking water and wastewater investments, let me just begin today by, by sharing a bit of my own personal history on these issues and invite our colleagues to maybe recall a bit of their own history. My uh, sister Sheila and I were born in Beckley, West Virginia, a coal mining town in the southern part of the state. Uh, for two of the six years that our family resided in the mountain state, we lived outside of Beckley, a coal mining town. And we lived alongside a stream known as Beaver Creek. Uh, we lived uh, outside of Beckley and uh, by a couple of miles. Sometimes my sister and I, and along with other kids in our tiny community, would uh, play on the banks of Beaver Creek. Uh, chasing frogs, trying to catch the, uh, the small fish uh, that swam there. We're never allowed to eat uh, fish caught in Beaver Creek, though. And our neighbors didn't eat them either. Why? Because we were told in no uncertain terms by our parents that it wasn't safe to eat those fish. In time, uh, we learned uh, some of the reasons why it was unsafe. Uh, some of the septic tanks the nearby residents relied upon were not well maintained. And as a result, raw sewage and other pollution would sometimes end up seeping into Beaver Creek. My sister Sheila and I would uh, go on to grow up in Danville, Virginia, located right on the border with uh, North Carolina. Uh, Danville, Virginia had once been the last capital of the Confederacy. And by the time we got there, it had become the home of Dan River Cotton Mills, and uh, as well as the world's biggest tobacco market. Even our radio station was the WBTM, world's biggest tobacco market. Uh, we lived in a, what I suppose was a middle-class neighborhood just outside of town, and we drank water from a well in our own backyard that was located less than 100 feet from our septic tank. My senior year in high school, I was fortunate enough to win a Navy ROTC scholarship, attended Ohio State University, and there uh, in Columbus, Ohio, we drank water provided by the city of Columbus, which also treated the sewage of the cities close to a half million inhabitants. Several years after graduating uh, from Ohio State in 1968 and while deployed to Southeast Asia as a naval flight officer during the Vietnam War, I would learn that the Cuyahoga River, which flowed through Cleveland, Ohio, had actually caught on fire. I dubbed it uh, the fire herd around the world. And it served as a wake-up call to our nation to get serious and began addressing the air and water pollution that were all too prevalent in much of our country. Spurred by this wake-up call, our president at the time, Richard Nixon, by executive order and affirmed by the Congress, created the Environmental Protection Agency in 1970. And inspired in part by the burning Cuyahoga River, Cuyahoga River and outrage at the indiscriminate dumping of pollution into rivers, streams, and wetlands around this country, Congress enacted the Clean Water Act in 1972 over the veto of then-president Richard Nixon. The goals of the Clean Water Act are at the same time simple and profound. And I'm gonna, these are the words. To restore and maintain the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of the nation's waters. Let me just repeat that. To restore and maintain the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of the nation's waters. The Clean Water Act, uh, Congress uh, ambitiously declared that the waters of the United States would be fishable and swimmable by 1983, and that there would be no more pollution discharged into our waters by 1985. Two years later, in 1974, then-President Gerald Ford signed the Safe Drinking Water Act into law. In the years that followed, cities and communities across our country applied to EPA 
for grant funding to help build new drinking water systems and improve existing ones. Similarly, with the help of EPA grants, communities across America built or upgraded wastewater treatment systems to clean up the wastewater being discharged into rivers and streams. Over time, grant requests greatly exceeded the funding available through EPA grants. And during the Reagan administration, a controversial new approach was proposed. The creation of revolving loan funds administered and managed by each state. And after considerable debate and compromise, this proposal was enacted into law. I was serving in the House of Representatives at the time and ended up supporting that proposal. And thus the concept of state revolving funds was born in 1987. The Clean Water Program was an alternative financing mechanism for the construction of wastewater facilities. Congress extended the same revolving loan fund concept to federal drinking water programs in 1996. Federal funds seeded revolving funds in all 50 states and in Puerto Rico and provided support for projects in the other territories and in the District of Columbia right here. This federal support leveraged state and local funding along with revenues generated by utilities. In the years immediately following the creation of these funds, Congress periodically modified them to meet the changing needs in cities and communities across our country and inspired the, news, the use of new technologies. In more recent years, however, the, the programs languished and the authorizations for the state revolving funds were in dire need of updating. In 2018, for the first time in 22 years, 22 years, Congress reauthorized the Drinking Water State Revolving Fund. It did so for three years. The Clean Water State Revolving Loan Fund, used for wastewater and other vital needs, has not been reauthorized in nearly, get this, 35 years. And now the Drinking Water State Revolving Fund is set to expire at the end of this year. At the end of this year. Somebody should do something. And that somebody is us. Needless to say, we've fallen woefully short of Congress's lofty ambitions to create fishable and swimmable waters by 1983 and to eliminate the discharge of pollution into navigable waters by 1985. It's also clear that the system we have now, despite our best efforts, isn't enough to meet the needs of our communities, particularly those who cannot afford to participate in loan programs to upgrade an increasingly inadequate drinking water and wastewater facilities. For far too many families in this nation, access to safe, clean drinking water and a healthy environment is, to be frank with you, just a, dr a dream, just a dream. And a lot of folks, too many folks, face a real crisis. All too often, we see headlines telling of the poor state of water infrastructure in our country and its lack of resilience in the face of severe weather. Not that long ago in Texas, earlier this year, nearly 15 million people, 15 million people lost access to clean water. When plummeting temperatures broke, water mains brought power down to drinking water facilities across that state. In Jackson, Mississippi, that same harsh weather caused over 80 water main breaks and left tens of thousands of people without water, particularly in predominantly African-American neighborhoods. But as we all know, this goes well beyond a few isolated cases. The problem of water in our nation runs much deeper. Millions of Americans still lack consistent access to clean drinking water today. The American Society of Civil Engineers 2021 report this year called for uh, or reported that America's infrastructure, they gave a, they give out grades A, B, C, D, E, F. And they uh, gave uh, our water system a grade of C minus. Uh, I don't know about my colleagues, I never got much of a pat on the back when I bring a home a C minus on my report card, neither did my sister. And uh, C minus is not uh, satisfactory in my family and I think for our country. That same report early this year also revealed that there's a water main break every two minutes, every two minutes in the United States, and that six billion gallons of treated drinkable water are lost each day to leaks in crumbling water supply systems. 
Six billion gallons. And that begs the question, how much is six billion gallons anyway? Well, it's enough lost water to fill 9,000 swimming pools. Let me repeat that. It's enough water to fill 9,000 swimming pools. Not each year, not each month, not each week, every day. Some communities report losing a quarter or even half of their drinking water to leaking pipes. In my own state of Delaware, where Senator Coons and I come from, communities like Ellendale, Delaware, and the southern part of our state have struggled for years to find and afford safe alternatives to increasingly polluted drinking water wells. And Ellendale is not alone. Thousands in communities of color, in tribal communities, rural communities, and others struggle not only with access to clean water and wastewater treatment, but also with the capacity to afford the infrastructure necessary to provide and meet those services. Let me emphasize, clean water is an essential part of our healthy lives, healthy economics, and a healthy environment. But for those communities who simply cannot afford to pay back loans or for needed water infrastructure, we got to find a better way. And I think uh, by working across the aisle and working hard, our committee, the Environment and Public Works Committee, is suggesting that better way in the legislation before us today. I'm pleased to report, to Madam President, that these are challenges that we have sought to address head on with this legislation. This bipartisan legislation that we consider today authorizes more than $35 billion for drinking water and wastewater infrastructure programs at the Environment, uh, Environmental Protection Agency over the next five years. These programs will create jobs, make our communities healthier by building, by repairing, by upgrading, and by modernizing our, our nation's aging drinking water and wastewater infrastructure systems. Here's how. First, the measures takes the historic step of reauthorizing the Clean Water State Revolving Loan Fund for the first time in 35 years. 35 years. And it does so by increasing funding levels for the first time since 1987. This legislation also reauthorizes the Drinking Water State Revolving Loan Fund, a program whose authorization expires, as I mentioned earlier, at the end of this year. This fund helps to ensure that clean water flows. Whenever we turn on our faucet, that clean water comes out of it. Next, uh, this bill makes sure that we're helping our fellow Americans most in need, the least of these, most in need, by boosting funding for programs that fund projects in low-income areas and rural communities and tribal lands and communities of color that have historically have been left behind by investments in our water infrastructure. According to a recent analysis, water systems with multi-year safe drinking water violations are 40%, 40% more likely to be in places with higher proportion of people of color. Drinking water quality violations are by far the most frequent in low-income rural communities where local governments struggle to finance the most basic water infrastructure needs. To help resolve this historic injustice, more than 40% of this bill's investments are targeted to help disadvantaged communities. The bill authorizes, our bill authorizes more than a billion in new funding to reduce lead in drinking water. And particularly for our country's rural areas, tribal populations, and low-income neighborhoods, our bill invests another billion dollars into programs to connect households to drinking water and wastewater systems and services. Wide disparities in opportunity and investment are also present in tribal communities. Our legislation grows the tribal drinking water program by 20 percent and reforms programs to help tribal education agencies remove lead from their drinking water systems too. This legislation does far more than just fix what's broken, Madam President. To borrow a phrase from our President Joe Biden, this legislation actually does build back better by fortifying water infrastructure for our new and worsening climate reality. I'll be honest with you, Madam, Madam President and colleagues, ours, uh, in this country, ours is a future that promises more severe weather events like hurricanes, like floods, droughts, and bitterly cold weather. 
It is a future, like it or not, with more and more people living on the front lines of sea level rise, like my state of, uh, the home state of Delaware, the lowest lying state in our nation. To that end, the bill provides a combined $500 million to make our water infrastructure systems more resilient and adaptable in face of extreme weather events. Within that historic investment is a new $125 million program, which will, for the first time, for the first time, provide grants to communities seeking to fortify the wastewater systems against climate change's impact. Finally, with our eyes focused on the future, our, our bill expands government's role by, in researching and developing the water technologies for tomorrow. By investing in technologies to improve, for example, stormwater control and waste management. By doing so, we can help American companies export innovation while not exporting jobs, rather by creating them right here. This is not just a bill to spread and suspend and, and build, though, but legislation that will direct our agencies to build and spend more wisely. We know that investment in innovation, as envisioned in the bill before us, can have a profound positive impact on our economy, creating jobs and fostering growth for our entire nation. We can, in uh, short, uh, seize opportunity in the face of uh, so much adversity. As we say in Delaware, carpe diem, seize the day. Actually, we say carpe diem, <laughs> seize the day. There's a, an old uh, African proverb that comes to mind, Madam President. It goes something like this. If you want to uh, go fast, travel alone. If you want to go far, travel together. And on uh, this bill, Madam President, uh, I can proudly say that Senator Capito and our colleagues on the Environment and Public Works Committee have chosen to travel together. The Drinking Water and Wastewater Infrastructure Act of 2021 passed out of our Environment and Public Works Committee with a resounding vote of 20 to 0. 20 to 0. And from uh, outside the halls of Congress, this bill has earned praise from across the political spectrum, from big cities to small communities. A group of uh, government officials that include the U.S. Conference of Mayors wrote that this uh, measure will, and I quote, help address the many water uh, infrastructure challenges that communities face. I go on to quote, local leaders support the Drinking Water and Wastewater Infrastructure Act as a reliable, long-term, and increased in federal investment in the water infrastructure, close quote. Representing our less populated areas of the country, places like Raleigh County, West Virginia, where I was born, my sister and I were born, Senator Capito knows it well, as Joe Manchin knows it well, his wife's from there. But places like uh, Raleigh County, West Virginia, Sussex County, and Southern Delaware, the Rural Community Assistance Partnership says, and, and I quote, proud, this is what they, they say of our legislation, proud to support this bill because Americans deserve clean, safe, reliable, and affordable drinking water, regardless of the community size or zip code, close quote. I could not agree more. We know that uh, access to safe, reliable, and healthful water isn't a blue state or a red state issue. It's an issue that goes to the core of the promise afforded to every American in Thomas Jefferson's um, Declaration of Independence, our country's Declaration of Independence, but largely penned by Thomas Jefferson. These words, the promise of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. If we'll be honest with ourselves, none of us can expect to pursue, much less enjoy this American ideal. If we don't have access to clean water to drink, because without water, we have no life. So the need for action on this issue is clear. To that end, I've been grateful for the partnership of our ranking member, Senator Capito. I'm proud this measure is the very first piece of infrastructure le legislation, I believe, to report it out of a Senate committee in this, the 117th Congress. The Environment and Public Works Committee has a long tradition, as some know, of working across the aisle to get significant legislation over the finish line. And this bill is the latest example of the kind of work that we do. I like to say we're workhorses, not show horses. And, but I, this is the first one that uh, so Senator Capito and I have been able to work on together, and I'm grateful for all that she and her staff have done to help get us to this day. I oftentimes say that bipartisan solutions are lasting solutions. Think about that. Bipartisan solutions are lasting solutions. And that's how I think we should approach almost all of our work here, in the Senate by reaching out to our colleagues across the aisle where we can to create lasting solutions to the problems, challenges facing our nation. 
And this bill before us today is a, par a product of that kind of partnership. The legislation is a result of tireless, dedicated work by a ranking member, Senator Capito, by her staff, and by my own. And I want to thank them and every member, every member of our committee, for all of their outstanding bipartisan work, for all their contributions to helping us craft this legislation over the last uh, several months. I especially want to note on my staff, John, John Kane, who's sitting here right, uh, right behind me, Annie D'Amato, uh, Margaret McIntosh, also known as Mackey, Tyler Hoffman, Reardon, and uh, our fearless staff director, Mary Frances Repco, and uh, another member of our team who used to be part of our e EPW team who's now leaving our staff. Uh, this is her last day, Ashley Morgan. And uh, we want to thank uh, her for all of her help uh, in uh, the last couple of years. I also want to thank uh, Adam, Th Adam Tomlinson for his leadership with ranking uh, member Capito and her EPW team, including Jess Kramer and Travis. We, uh, we thank them all very, very much. And uh, finally, a big shout out to our water subcommittee chair, uh, Senator Duckworth, for taking the lead to introduce this excellent measure, along with Senator Cardin and EPW committee ranking members, uh, Lum Lummis, Senator Lummis uh, of, uh, of Wyoming, and uh, Senator Kramer. And it's been a pleasure to work with each of you and your staffs. I would go so far as to say a labor of love, a labor of love. And with this uh, bill's level of support, it is my hope that we can seize this momentum and pass this measure quickly this week. I urge all my colleagues to join Senator Capito and me in supporting this excellent bill.